All right, so our first one is literary narrative, and then of course our second one is social science, and then our next one is going to be, oh, the humanities, and last, natural science. So let's start with our humanities. Uh, so we're actually just gonna have to take turns reading this. I'll go ahead and start, okay? So, and whenever I read, I want to focus on active reading, so, and asking questions as you read, being engaged in the text, and all that good stuff. So here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in a little bit, just a smidge. All right. One of my best races could hardly be called a race at all. I was a senior in high school, gunning to qualify for the USA Junior Olympic Nationals. The previous summer, I had missed the cut by less than a second in the mile. And just the day before, at my high school regional meet, I had come with three-tenths of a second in the 500-yard freestyle. The qualification time was four, what was that, minutes, 39 and 69 milliseconds. I swam, looks like, just barely milliseconds away. The next day, Sunday, I drove with the mother to the, to the far side of Houston, where a time travel was held. An informal, unadvertised event thrown together last minute. All right, so what's happened so far? Can we summarize this? Um, he's talking about, like, I guess a race that happened in his past and an important scene to him. Definitely important scene and also always falling short, right? Always falling short. Yeah. And then one day going to this informal event, right? Um, the only races swum... The only race to swim were those the swimmers requested to swim. Most were short, flopping sprints in which summer swimmers attempted to shave off a few hundredths of a second. I didn't have the courage to face the mile, and since I'd struck out in the 500 the day before, I decided to swim the 1,000-yard freestyle, 40 lengths of the pool. It was a race I had swum fast enough to believe that given the right confluence of circumstances, so it's like given the right circumstances, Cold water, aggressive heat, energetic meat, I can make the cut. I had 15 seconds to drop to qualify. All right, how about this last little bit? What is, what is the author saying about, about this, this event she's about to do? Um, it's kind of like stressful and um, it's really like important to her also. Yeah, important, but it almost seems like, hey, this is something she has like 15 seconds. That's quite a bit to drop to qualify. And she's just deciding to do the 1,000 yard freestyle. All right, why don't you go ahead and give this a read for me? Does this sound good? Could you read this one? Yeah. All right, let's hear by it. The, by the time I stood up, stood up on the blocks, I was not only the not the I was not only the only one in the race. I was practically the only one in the natatorium. natatorium. Yeah. The horn the horn sounded, and I drove in. I was angry and disheartened after at having missed the cut the day before and i had little belief that i could go any fast today good 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 so what happened in the paragraph summarize it for me um so she kind of talked about the uh practically she felt like nobody was watching her like uh that she was completely alone i guess and uh how much stress that brought up on her yeah yeah good good um and to actually wait what about the stress thing how do you know or is that inferred did you infer uh, that it's inferred yeah, okay, actually, one thing I want to be wary of is, is kind of, don't, don't infer so much, right? We can't necessarily infer that it was stressful for her, because what if she does really well because there's nobody, right? So I don't think we can infer that, that she's stressed here. We, we can know that she's angry and disheartened at missing the cut the day before, but that has nothing to do with the current conditions. Sound good? All right, about, I'll read the next one. 600 yards in, my coach started to get, uh, started to pace. I stayed steady on, not in a hurry. Not about to get my hopes up. In my mind, I had already missed the time. Then, a boy from the rival high school, whom I hardly knew, unfolded his legs and climbed down from the bleachers and started to cheer. He squatted low to the water and pointed his finger toward the end, as if to say, that's where you're going, now hurry up. I thought, if he's cheering, maybe I'm close. Okay, see, what's actually happening here? Uh, she's kind of 600. Yeah, maybe, maybe she's actually gonna make it. You never know. Right? Um, and uh, um, by David Glynn, and I don't know if we know that it's a female. So let's just say the swimmer. And so here, the swimmer, do we know it's a female? I don't think I so, don't right? Know. All right, so so let's just say the swimmer. And so, yeah, basically like nobody's there and the swimmer's like, oh, I don't think I'm gonna make it, right? Um, but then there's somebody who starts cheering for the swimmer and he's like, whoa, okay, maybe I will. Could you go ahead and read this one now? Sometimes a moment comes along when the world slows us down. And though everything else moves around moves around us at the same frenetics, we're, we're afforded the opportunity to reflect in real time rather than in retrospect. 
Okay, hold up there. That was wordy. That was wordy here. What what is this saying? It's kind of like everything freezes when you're in that single moment. Yeah, and you kind of slow down. Good. And then keep going. So it says it. Um, it. It is as though. It is. Wait. Where is? Oh, it is as though we slip into a warm horn, warm hole in the fabric of time and space, traveling into the past and then back again to the present in the same instant. That morning, swimming. I remember the day in late September, the year before. The last day my swim had used an outdoor pool. A summer along by teammates, and I swim under an open sky. After this day, we would spend the rest of the season in a dank and moldy and door. Yeah, and so last time we talked about what makes good writing. It's kind of not relevant to the ACT, but good writing is, is descriptive, transports you, right? And so it'd be fun in your writing, you'd say like, as though we slip into a wormhole on the fabric of time and space. That's cool and descriptive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and also along swim in the open sky. You spend the rest of the season in a dank, moldy indoor pool. Cool. The triangular backstroke flags were strung across the lanes in the adjacent diving well. My teammates like to run down the long cement deck, jump over the diving well, and try to grab hold of the line. Many of them could jump far enough to make it. I could not, though I tried every day. I tried that day and missed. Since I would not have another shot until May, I decided to try again. Squared up and ran, my feet wet against the pavement, and just as my foot hit the water's edge, one of the teammates called out, jump! I bent my knees and pushed off hard and got my hand around the flag line. I pulled the whole thing into the water. Autumn was coming, and I wondered if there was a metaphor in what I'd just done. Fortune folded inside a cookie. My greatest effort would come when I was down to my last opportunity. So what's this little bit about? Um, it's kind of about, wait, like paragraph 50? or Yeah, yeah, right here. Like, uh, so I guess it's kind of about um, feeling like exactly what she felt at the moment, all her senses, what she heard, um, and what, what, I guess what they heard. And um, for, could, uh, well, it has some synonyms kind of to represent um to kind of represent how she felt like similar to uh relate to what the reader is feeling as well yeah yeah, yeah. and this might be important here comparing it to a fortune fold inside a cookie my greatest effort comes from my last opportunity i can see them asking a question about that metaphor cool sounds good could you just give this last one a read this last little paragraph here now it was march and i was down to my last opportunity thinking about that day and hearing the word jump as my eyes followed the finger of the boy pointing me onward what i understood not later but right then in the water was how little the swim added up to the world. I had spent more than a year training for this one swim, and when it was finished, the world would be no different than before it began. If no one else cared, then the swim was mine alone. If it it mattered because it was the task for me now, the thing I wanted now, swimming I had long understood is a constant choice in the now and the later. A exhaustion now for the sake of fitness later all those friday nights spent in the pool in pursuit of an of an end that seemed nights spent in the point that seemed always one step farther on i was out of laters this was the end and i made my choice i cast yeah, all those friday in. nights spent the pool in pursuit of what it was always one step further on nice okay keep going keep going i cashed in the energy i set aside for climbing out of the pool and unfolding my towel and tying my shoes i've never sprinted harder in my life not before, not since. I hit the wall. I knew my instinct by the spasm of my tendons and the ache in my bones. Before I ever t- turned toward the clock or heard my old scream that I had made it. Cool. This is nice. Getting caught up in the moment, right? This is yep. intense swimming. All right, let's see if we've understood the passage well enough to answer so many questions. Here we go. The narrator of the passage can be described as a swimmer who primarily what? Let's see. Recalls the swim of his life. Once again, we just know it's, I think it's going to be a male here. Uh, why? Because the guy's name is David. Yeah, David. Anyways, recall the swim of his life and the factors that motivated. What do you think about that answer? Uh, the okay, wait. The calls and the factors that. Um, I think it's calls the swim. Of his life. Um, I think is it's. It, is it the swim of his life? Uh, well, yeah, kind of. Yeah, and the factors that motivate him. Talk about it. Yeah, the uh, running. The, yep, yep. So I would just go ahead and choose this. This is definitely, definitely right. Yep. At the running, the shouting, and also just this inner determination and how it felt. There's mm-hmm. two passages, two paragraphs to talk about that. Good. Yeah. So it's yeah. A for one. Two. 
Which following events mentioned occurs first chronologically? A lot of students miss this one, so take this one carefully, okay? Nateria stood on the blocks on Sunday. Oh, wait, which of the following? Thoughts on F? Uh, the Nateria which stood on the blocks at the Sunday time trial. Um, I think F the Nateria. Any ideas in that one? Stood on the blocks at the Sunday. Um, I don't think so, because I'm pretty sure he was someone. I think the narrator is the uh, one who the actual character, the actual main character. Yeah, okay, so we just need to, this is just about chronology, okay, so just, just chronology. So we have to ask, okay, what what occurred first? So check this out. I remembered a day in late September the year before. Is that going to be the earliest thing? Um. Yeah, I think so. Yes, that is the earliest thing. So that's going to come first. That's going to be G, okay? Narrator lived at the diving wall in late September. Does that make sense? Because it talks about late September. Everything else is talking about the time trial moment, right? And that comes after that, okay? Because this is an old memory, whereas this is more recent. Sound good? Yeah. yeah. Three. Nary describes an auditorium as being empty of spectators the day of the race in order to do what? All right, so illustrate the perfect racing conditions. Hope for a warrant likely to occur. Yeah, right? Because typically they say an auditorium is, uh, she kind of likes it whenever you have people, he kind of likes it when you have a bunch of people cheering. And it also look at this. The right confluence of circumstances and energetic meat. See that? So why? So what does that imply about the empty auditorium? Is that propitious? I mean, is that favorable conditions or not? Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, no. The the well, like it is maybe technically, but the swimmer does not think so. And how do you know this? Because how do you know that it's not favorable? What? Wait, it's not favorable. Because... Yeah, empty empty auditorium is not favorable according to the swimmer. And how do I know that? Even what I highlighted there. Can you see what I highlighted and then see how that... I guess it wasn't like something he had in mind. Like when swimming, he didn't much enjoy it. No. So here it says, it's a race that's swim enough if only it had the right conditions. And I see how they have a dash? Yeah. And that, that's going to specify the conditions. Cold water, aggressive heat, energetic meat. These are three things that are helpful for what? Uh, the right confidence. Sir. Yeah, the right circumstances, right? Is this making sense or no? Yeah. Energetic meat is helpful, right? For the right, it's part of the right circumstance. And so if they see that, they have an empty auditorium. Is that an energetic meat? Uh, wait, the empty. Yeah, if it's uh, empty, is it energetic? No. No, right? So that's the perfect racing conditions are not likely to occur. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, now I'll see four. Narrator indicates that he swam the thousand yard freestyle and time trials of the world for a moment seemed to do what? Do you remember this one from the passage? See if you can answer it. What do you think? Uh, freestyle and time. Thousand. Uh, wasn't this at the beginning, like the first pass, first uh, paragraph? Um, whenever, so indicates when you swim a thousand yards, it's a little bit later. There's this passage. First of all, what's the answer? Is it speed up or slow down? Uh, so can you go back to the question? Maybe? Yeah, whenever there's something a thousand meter, uh -huh. thousand yard, does it does the world slow up or speed? Does it slow down or speed up? Uh, speed up. What? Speed up. No, it's no, no, no. Sometimes a moment comes along where the world slows down. See that? See this? Yeah. So it's not speed up. It slows down. And though everything else moves around us the same for next speed, we're for the opportunity to do what? Uh, to, wait. To reflect? In real time rather than retrospect. What does that mean? It means to like live in the moment instead of in the past. Yep. Yep. So now which of the answers to this, this reflect? What do you think? Um, Take your time. Read through them. Um, Jay. Yeah, good. You got it. Slow down, right? Because these say speed up, so wrong. As everything around him is wrong, because it says the world comes back like in normal time. Um, the world is not going at the same speed. As it explicitly says, and so this is good. Literally says it. Now five. The passage indicates during the narrator's swim, the time trial, he understood for the first time that what he understood for the first time. Um, His goals would always be one step further on. What do you think about that one? His goals would always be one step um, um, I guess. Kind of, but he had, he had kind of like a different mindset, I guess. Yeah, this, this is actually kind of just random. I don't think this is ever mentioned, so no. He had trained for this for every year. He understood for the first time that he had trained for it for a year. No, right? The swim was an event that was important to him alone. What do you think about that one? Uh, I don't know. I don't so. When he's doing the time trial, he realizes that this is important for him, right? So let's see. The slip through this wormhole of that moment and lead this this way. Outdoor pool, all along with teammates here. I'd spend the uh, long hours here. How the teammates are coming. Let's see. What I understood was how little this swim added to the world. It's more to your training. When I finish the world, we were no different. 
If nobody else cared, what? What does this say? It says, if no one else cared, then this mind alone. So what realization is that? Um, that it's kind of like it's all his moment. Uh, it should be about him at that point. Yep, so the swim is an event that's important to him alone, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you can see these questions are very easy. They're like directly in the text. All right, now this one. Based on the passage at the end, the narrator mentions in line 80, most likely uh, refers to his what? So the end in line 80 refers to what? Let's see. I was at later's. This was the end. I made my choice. So what is the end referring to? What do you think? Uh, his choice of uh, whether he, wait, and I made. I was out of. He he had he wanted to start living in the moment and uh think about a better like uh, you know try. He made his decision on uh like he set his mind on swimming. Yeah, and what race. achievement exactly? Uh, but winning the race. What race? Uh, the U.S. Junior National. Yep, 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 yep. And so, what is this referring to specifically? Oh, uh, this is. Wait, the end of the race. Which race? Uh, the U.S. Junior National. And not that one particularly, but saying this uh, is the, oh, end. the like yeah. the end of the journey, like kind of. The last chance to qualify. Oh, okay. All right, does that make sense? Why it's G? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, now the next one. Narrator of the passage characterizes the time travel in Houston as what? Any ideas? What's your first intuition on this one? Um, this one should be very easy, actually. So just look through the answers and choose one. And I bet you're going to get it right. Don't overthink it, though. It's easy to overthink these. One long sprint makes that a total of three quads of Not D, because it isn't really informal. Wait, in, in, oh, wait, wait, informal. Wait, the time trial in Houston. Wait, it is informal, right? Like, it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, I think so maybe D. D. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. You got it right. Good job. It's very informal, right? Very informal. Definitely last minute. Yeah, perfect. Eight, the statement, that's where we're going to hurry up. It can mostly be attributed to what? If you remember this part, do you remember this part or should I remind you a little bit? Um, that's where you're going to hurry. Uh, no, I don't remember. Okay, so this is whenever there's a, there's a boy who comes to cheer the person on, right? And, and the guy is like pointing to the wall, like that's where you're going to hurry up. So it points to the wall where he needs to go. All right, so... That is attributed to the narrator because he speculates what the cheering boy means. The narrator's interpretation is when he's like, why is he saying that's where you're going to hurry up? Like, this isn't expressly stated, but it's just the narrator says this about the cheering boy, right? Yeah. But, so it's, uh, it's H. Now, nine, for the narrator compared to practicing in the outdoor pool, practicing indoor is what? Does he like the indoor? What do you think? Uh, wait, is it like the narrator indicates where the narrator is um, less appealing? Right, because uh, it was in the uh, other, I forgot. Uh, can you scroll back up? I think it was in one of the earlier paragraphs. Yep. Talked about it. Here, I'll give you a little, a little help here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was the indoor. He found it uh, less appealing. Yeah, less appealing, you think? Final answer? Yeah. Are you sure? For $1,000. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, it is C. Good job. All right, now 10. An area here is jumping his mind while swimming. He's most likely remembering what? Any, um, do you remember this a little bit? Or should we go get some context? Uh, context. Okay. So we have to think jump. He's reminded of what? So 67. Wait, so the, the whole thing. Water. Um, you should scroll back down to the question. Remember? Uh, J. I think it's J. Abrupt start of the rate. Nope. Nope. Uh, so for this one, if you look at uh, this one right here, it says the jump, right? And then here... Remember this jump? Yeah. It's the teammates yelling jump. It's oh, not the start okay. of the race. This is something they did before. Just the boys. And the boys would do this thing. All right. And what did the boys do? Well, they did this thing when they would, um, when, when he caught the flag line, his command of the day that he, that he caught the line. That's when he remembers. Because remember, he tells the story about how he caught the line and how he like focused in on it and stuff. So that's exactly what he's referring to. It was March and my last opportunity to think about the day and hear the word jump. What I understood, not later. So in this world, it's for your training, and this is the flag line, the triangle flags. And then he's thinking about that and how he jumped. All right. Is it clear now after we've gone over it? Yeah. Okay. Time for this next passage. Let's see if we can do a little bit better on this one. Social science. Passage A is and passage B. So these ones, you break it up into two parts. You start with A, and then you answer A's questions, and then you do B, and then you answer B's questions. So can you go ahead and read these first little two paragraphs here for this one? Oh, first of all, though, you gotta you gotta do this so from the book Apple Global History, and this one is the Featherland of Apples. So let's go ahead. Could you read these first two, and then I'll tag team you there. So 
Go ahead and give it a, give it a start for Passage A. Uh, in early September of 1929, Nikolai Vavilo, the, uh, Vavilov, the famed Russian plant explorer and botanist, arrived in the Central Asian crossroads of Alma Ata, the Kazakhstan, uh, climbing up the Sail Jeski Sail Jeski. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Allowed two slopes of the Tian Shan Mountain, separating Kazakhstan from China. Vavilov found thickets of wild apples stretching in every direction. An intensive, extensive forest of fruit, c- c- colored russet, red, creamy yellow, and vibrant pink. Nowhere else in the world do apples grow thickly as a forest or with such incredible diversity. Amazed by what he saw, Pavlov wrote, I could see with my own eyes that I had stumbled upon the center of origin for the apple. Good. Next next paragraph. Go ahead and read it. Um, with extraordinary pre-science and a few facts, Pavlov suggested that the wild apples he had seen growing in the Tian Shan were the fact of ancestors, uh, the modern apple. At ancestors of the modern apple, he tracked the whole process of domestication to the mountains near Alma Ata, where the wild apples look awfully similar to the apple found at a local grocery. Uh, unfortunately, Vavilov's theory would remain mostly unknown for decades. All right, summarize this for me. What do we get? Really basic summary. Uh, guy from Russia goes to uh, China to separate it from Kazakhstan. After, uh, well, uh, not he didn't, but uh, while it was being separated, he uh, studied. I guess he went to this uh, mountain and. Uh, Oh, slopes, oh, yeah, uh, Tian Shan Mountains, and uh, he studied a certain type of apple uh, species or variety. Good, good, good. Okay, nice. And then uh, he made a theory, but it was uh, somewhat uh, discontinued after he found out that it was all just like, I don't know, for nothing, that he could find these in common grocery stores, I guess. So he took the whole process of domestication where they looked awfully similar to these in the grocery store. It looks like what he's done is he finds domestication in the mountains and sees how they're similar here. All right. And so basically the diversification of apples, evolution of apples, he finds a really awesome source in Kazakhstan. So I'm going to go ahead and read this one. Exactly where they came from has long been a matter of contention and discussion among people. Vavilov and Prism by this Stalin in the 1940s wrote a book on plant, a work on plant genetics that challenged Stalin's belief. He died in Leningrad prison in 1943, only after the fall of communism, Russia, and Vavilov's theory, and more than half a century later became widely recognized. What is this saying? Summarize it. Um, we're gonna it. What? Uh, nothing. Uh, so basically, apples from where they came from and Vavilov and his theory, mm-hmm. largely unknown, right? Because of Stalin's regime. But then afterwards, now you realize it. Okay, next. As Pavlov predicted, it's now believed that all the authors of today are direct descendants from the wild apples discovered in Kazakhstan. All apples spring to this one. Cool. Apples not compromise the plant bounty, however, and at least 157 species in Kazakhstan are direct precursors, 12 relatives, and all the stuff, 90% of the cultivated tempered fruits. The name of Kazakhstan's greatest city, Alma Ada, is known today to translate the father of apples, where apples are. So this news about the origins and surprise residents, particularly in towns and seedlings, and so the apple has been evolving in Central Asia for upwards of 4.5 million years. What's this one saying? Um, they say it's as well. All uh, I guess it's like uh, the his the apple tea founder, like all uh, uh, wild apples that are coming found in Kazakhstan. Yeah, yeah wild apples. found in Kazakhstan. Um, basically, what they're saying is here this name here. Um, so Kazakhstan Alma Ata leans father apples because why all apples kind of like originate from there. Sound good? Yeah. Let's answer this the questions for A. All right, the use of the words thickets in this sense of forest passage A. Do what to emphasize which points? Okay, let's see. Here, it's going to be the magnitude of the wild apples. Why? Because that's the place that has a bunch of diverse things. When we talked about extensive forests and the stretching in every direction. That talks about how um, many there are of the wild apples and how it's like super crazy, how many and how vast. So D. Sound good? Yep. The author A uh, likely suggests the wild apples growing in the Tian Shan. It's more like apples found in the grocery stores to support the belief that what? So why does he do the whole grocery store comparison? What do you think? Oh, the grocery store. Wait. Um... I think it was because it kind of showed that his apples were basic and they weren't anything special to look up upon. They were just happened to be found in those mountains. They were found in the mountains. Okay. So many apple stocks were harvested in uh, the Tian Shan. Not necessarily. It's possible, but not necessarily. So I don't know about that one. In the Tian Shan, Vavilov likely found the wild ancestors of the domesticated apple. What do you think about this one? that is good why yeah. because this is where they originate yeah. if they look like it and they originate from there then likely they're the ancestors of it 
Yeah. So G is good. So it's G. 13. Passage A makes which of the following claims about the plant species defined in Kazakhstan? What do you think? So let's go through one by one. 157 species cultivated near to this. I don't think it actually says that, does it? Wait, I think it did. Which following claims um, about plant species that are found in Kazakhstan? Oh, about, wait, Passage 157 A. species cultivated uh, temper fruits originated from here. No, I don't think so. Do they talk about the like, types of fruits that originate there? I don't think they do. They don't remember that personally. 90% of all these things are either precursors or close to wild things planned right here. I think that's, that is a little bit off. Um, where do they talk about the, the precursors and all this stuff? Here it is. Apples do not comprise the plant's beauty, however. 157 plant species are for direct precursors of wild things and domesticated crops. Like 9%. 90% of the fruits. All right. So, yeah. It's not the fruits. That's 90% of the fruits. And the 90% of the crops, I guess that went wrong. It's 157 of plant species. That's what it is. So it's D. These ones all like get the details wrong. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. Next. B suggests that Vavilov was motivated to become agricultural scientist because why? Okay. Time for passage B here. Let's go ahead and read this one. Could you read this first little paragraph here? Nikolai Vavilov is widely regarded as the world's greatest plant explorer, where he made over 250,000 and tuber collections on five continents. Kazakh. Conversation, conver, conservation, conservation, conservation. Tatiana Solo, Solova credits him with first recognizing that Kazakhstan was the center of origin. There we go. And diversity for apples. It is not surprising she sees that when Vavilov first came to Kazakhstan to look at plants, he was so amazed. Nowhere else in the world do apples grow as a forest that is one reason why he started that he why he stated that this is probably where the apple was born this was its birthing ground Just nice like, uh, discerning where a crop originated and where the greatest portion of its genetic diversity remains extant may seem as esoteric to its initiated but knowing where exactly our food comes from, geographically culturally and genetically is of paramount importance to the rather small portions of our own sh that regular yeah research. esoteric to the uninitiated what does that mean that means seems way too specific for those for like normal studies about for people who don't know much okay when you read that it just seems like you kind of scrape by it but i think we need to dissect everything right esoteric means only known by a special handful of people specialized experts and uninitiated means like that you haven't engaged a lot all right anyways keep going um of paramount importance the uh, paramount to this rather small portion of our own species that regularly concerns itself with the issue of food security. The, var the variety of fruits that we keep in our fields, orchards, and secondarily in our seed banks is critically important. In protecting our food supply from plagues, crop diseases, catastrophic weather, and political up upheavals, Vavilov himself was personally motivated to become an agricultural scientist by witnessing several famines during the Sazarus era of Russia. He hoped Sars. that uh, Sars, uh, era of Russia. He hoped that by combining a more diverse seed polio with knowledge from both traditional farmers and collaborating scientists, the number of Russian families suffering hunger might be reduced. Good. So what does that passage do there? That's kind of talking about like his backstory, I guess, uh, what he hopes to do. Yeah, and motive. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. In a really real sense, the forests and the orchards, traditional farmers, and such centers, crop diversity of the wellsprings of diversity, the plant breeders, pathologists, and entomologists uh, return to every time a society whittles the resilience of the fields and orchards on the breaking point. Now, at Woodalow, we've done here in America, um, according to Apple Story, 16,000 variants have been named and hunted, oh, sorry, nurtured over the past four centuries. By this time, however, the identities and sources of only 7,000 the variants could be discerned. Since then, 6,000 varieties, 82%. I've been lost from the nursery catalogs, farmers markets, and the American table. So we've lost a lot, been a little bit irresponsible. All right, let's do love. Let's do which one were we on? 14. My strong says Vavilov became motivated for this primarily because why? That's the paragraph you read about the his desires. Why? Because he hopes to feed others, right? All right. And then B whittles away to refer to people um, where the apple varieties have been what? All right, so they've, they've been slowly diminishing, right? Yeah. Slowly diminishing. So gradually lost from the nursery table to the American table. Yeah, this is verbatim and this is right. Hey, next, as you use the lines here, the words named and nurtured most nearly means what? Do you remember this from the passage or should we look this one up? Um, I'll look it up. Okay, just real quick, like the apples that were named and nurtured, 
If they're going to be named, that means they have to be identified. Nominated doesn't sound right. Point to two and cited, so I think it's already going to be G. Cultivated. But let's check it out. 82. Some 16,000 have been named and nurtured. Yep, that means they've been identified and protected. Okay. Or allowed Wait, uh, to grow. Sec. I'm going to go get a sip of water. Okay, so this G for 16, then, and then let me know when you get back. Okay, hi, I'm back. All right, welcome back. Okay, so um, let's look at this one here. Ms. Susan for her paragraph, Center's Diversity. Okay, so I think we're, we're on, so. Yep, named and, and uh, culture means that they identified them and kept them going. All right, so reasonably for the third paragraph, that centers of crop diversity became crucially important when what? So 74 to 70 to 79. So foragers and this of diversity, plant breeders and all this, and time of society realized the resilience. So what were these things important to? Any ideas for 17? I can let you know on this one. It's going to be the problems of the cultivated crop require experts to research new variety of the crop. And so that one right here, could you just explain to me briefly what this is saying right here? Uh, which paragraph? Uh, 74 to 79. Oh, okay, seventy fourth. Um, in the orchards of traditional farming and breeders, uh, kind of saying that, uh, with all this culture kind of uh faster, like uh, focused around these apples, I guess uh his research kind of helped um thrive it. Widow, yeah, the resilience. Whenever it gets to his breaking point, what does that mean? Uh, and down to any idea? No, I don't. Okay, so when, that means it's like they're they're dying, right? There's not enough. It's going to reach its breaking point. There's just not enough to sustain it. And so using the diversity, they're able to rejuvenate it and bring it back, okay? So the cultivated crop require experts to research a new variety of the crop, right? Whenever it whittles away, you know what I'm saying? All right, now we'll go to 18. What's the following statement that describes the difference in the tone of the passage? Well, uh, honestly, like, huh. Well, let's see. A is all about, hey, we made this thing, which like all apples spring from, very celebratory. And B, um, what do you think about B? How is B different in your in your mind? Uh, passage. It says things are disappearing, right? Yeah. Apples are slowly going away. Whereas A is all about, hey, look at what we did. You know, this place is super cool. B is like, we're, it's going away. There's a problem. So H, definitely. Sound good? No? Yes? Yes, yes, it does. Okay. Compared to A, B provides information about what? So yeah, B focuses on the reduction of numbers of apples in North America, right? The, how they're disappearing from the tables. So A. Now 20, A quotes saying, I could see an origin of my eyes as upon the center of the origin of the apple. Passage B, this quote is directly what? Okay, I could see the own eyes stumble upon the center of the apple. Actually, if you can read on earlier, he says, it's recognized the center of the origin and diversity. It's not surprising that he sees there. So A is nowhere to apples grow this. Um, so see how he's saying it again. Bavilov is talking about it again. It's almost yeah. like they restated it, kind of. They restated the exact same thing. So here, the answer is going to be um, paraphrased by Silova, because that's what it is. This saying here in lines 11 through 12, if you read here, 11 through 12, boom, Bavilov wrote here. And then in the second one, Silova is actually just maybe saying that directly. Silova credits him with the first recognizing, right? All right, sound good for that one? Yeah. So para paraphrased by Silova. Good. All right. Now let's do this one. This will be our last one. Near the end of the eight years, uh, the saxophonist Luan Shu lived a short period in the orchestra, sending in the Bessie's band to Tenor Giants. Barry took lead solo in the song. The bass played for many years. Uh, had played for years. 28 seconds solo lasted. We were treated no less than musical personification of mind working together in divine tandem, mind and body. When you hear the recording, you're likely to wonder if you, why you've never heard of uh, Chu Berry before. Why you've never heard of him is simple. A lot of hardcore buffs know about him. Very solid session player who turns up in recordings with Bessie. Fletcher in this and this. But he did not cut many sessions himself as leader. When he soloed, he often worked with uh, recording constraints in the area, fast moving 78s, and the solo is often lasting from mere 32 beats. So short. People who loved Barry were not surprising other tenor, tenor players. Situation leading to the dreaded musician's musician tag. But not surprisingly, uh, nearly praise and after described to Perry, who, when given the opportunity to display music to a stereo that would be envied by future generations of horn men. Super good guy. Musicians love him. Sound good. Could you read this next two paragraphs? Perry faced a lot of other horn players having to grind it out long and hard until someone until something memorable burst through. The prejudices the prejudices and expectations of the listening public mm -hmm. and the accepted wisdom of what is <laughs> and isn't art in a given medium. In this case, swing was fodder for dance parties for not for not for music worth of study um oddly enough barry's geniality might help explain his failure to court history history's favor 
it wasn't in his nature to call attention to himself or his uh, playing board in 1908 in the, into the black middle class in Wheeling, West Virginia. The laid-back, affable Barry attended West Virginia State in Charleston, where he switched from alto sax to tenor and exhibited the willingness to fit in that character rise its presence in so many dance bands. He was the rare artist who refused to put his interests above those of the band, even if that meant playing ensemble passages rather than taking a healthy allotment of solo breaks. Yeah, so he's a modest guy. College provides training for Barry, teams up with amateur pro uh, outfits, never played some of the show off, and said he's playing positive attitudes in a given situation. Barry's performing in Callaway Ensemble, you hear some rag and tune playing, a few notes emerge, cool. Other players laughing, blowing through the charts, immediately surge up behind him, also all uh, fighting fit. Once he finishes the solo, the shenanigans resume. All right, so after making his way to New York, Barry becomes a uh, presence of student demand. Other great jazz orchestras swing air, followed by these peeps. Duke Ellington was prominent. He drew the acclaim. The sidemen were traveling salesmen. So somebody else says, uh, where is the best stock could manage? It was Fletcher and Barry to dig some of the sidemen's subservient trappings. For starters, Anderson wrote keys that were rare for the jazz orchestras and his somber and reflective voicings. Introspective approach to that. So there's some hard, there's some good stuff they synergistically play. Barry sounds as if he's been spoiled by a sax. Blues and C sharp minor, for instance, is odd, haunting, and relaxing. Barry's solo, slightly off mic, um, making the listener feel as if he's been playing for some time and finally hear him. The effect is unnerving, as if we're not playing uh, close attention. Here we go, Cab Callow Callaway granted Barry a showpiece, a ghost of the good chance. Soul recording in Barry's career to feature him start to finish, and it was body and soul, a response to Coleman's famous recording. Intended not to be a, a riposte of the rival, but the other half of the dialogue. It's your bottle line and disembodied from the music meant to accompany it, which is Spartan to begin with. This is Barry's tone and instance of indulgence on the record. A cathedral and a solo and its finishes, angles, and ornamentations or reflexivity. If the sunlight could pass through music, a ghost of chance would funnel the broadcast a spectrum of colors. So here we dissect uh, some of the works of them. And let's just kind of go through this super quickly here, just because we don't have super um, a bunch of time. All right. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so based on the passage, how did Barry's personality affect his career? Um, okay. So let's see here. So based on how did his personality affect his career? So he was modest, right? Remember how it says he's modest? So he's yeah, modest, yeah. he's going, kept him out of the spotlight. And so he had less attention as a performer. C. Very clearly C. The author mentions Barry's solo, Oh Lady, uh, Be Good, primarily in order to do what? Okay. So the reason is to give an example of his musical excellence. Uh, the author points, um, and so... The reason why this is very, very clear is like, oh, this is like a super good record. If you look back at the passage. All right, so 23, how many serious enthusiasts knew a little about him in order to do what? He talks about this in order to talk about why they might be unfamiliar with. Him. Yep, very, very simple. And uh, it's because of his modest personality and all that stuff. Very straightforward. He just does it just to explain this. There's nothing else going on. According to the author, Barry's solos and solo musicians were often very short because he, his solos were often very short. Why? Um, and so if you look to the passage, it's because there were some recording strains, and sometimes it said he can only get off like 32 beats. That passage is, uh, is up here. So the recording constraints it's over here. Um, hopefully it tracks until a few things emerge. It's over here when they talk about, um, yeah, 28 seconds of solo lasted this, which we know less personification in my body. And um, so why not? He solo constraints the area. Here it is. Working with constraints the area, swing genre, fast moving, 78s so of solos. That's the reason why. Constraints the music era. So it literally says that. Sometimes the answers literally will just tell you. This one, um, the author indicates that Barry's time as a musician, swing dance is primarily regarded as what? So here, um, it was like, they said it was like fodder, right? So music for dance parties, not music for study. That's literally from the passage, direct quote. It's like almost direct quote there. I know we're going really quickly, but just want to wrap this up before the time. So 35, the word court most nearly near means. That's when they said like that he failed to court their attention. So it's like to, to attract their attention. All right, then seventh paragraph, the author compares the sidemen to traveling salesmen in order to do what? All right, so when he talks about how the traveling salesman, what he's trying to do is at 57 here. He says that their role, so 57 after making his way, presence who is on demand, Duke Ellington and others, the sidemen, music traveling salesman sold in somebody else's waters. Basically, they're trying to help each other out. The sidemen, music traveling salesman who sold someone else the waters. Yeah, so they, these guys are just helping each other out. So let's see what the answer yeah. that is. Um, yeah, illustrate the sidemen's supportive role of the band. That's the reason why they did it. And last three questions here. So um, he describes it as odd, hunting, relaxing. This is directly from the passage. Very simple. Very, very simple. One. All right. Uh, June song, A Ghost and Chance. What is unique about it? Didn't he say that one was unnerving? Um, 
I think the reason here is that it's unique as Barry's all in it. And this is directly from the passage. It's him from the beginning to end. And then the Cathedral of a Solo most likely creates a sense that Barry's solo was what? Um, and so here, line 85, see what it says. 